It is good to have everyone back after a great lunch. Let us now begin with the most look forward part of today, the student dialogue. Ekbari, just give it to me a shout out and let me see. Do you think this is going to be exciting? All right. Do you think it is going to be interactive? Okay. And do you think it is going to be productive? All right. And do you think it is going to inspire you today? Sun nahi raha abhi. Maza nahi aa raha. Do you think it is going to inspire you today? Sounds better. Selfies le li. Okay. All right. Um, let's begin. So that is also a question. Shuru kare aage ka part. Let's begin. Yes, no. All right. There's a great yes to the student dialogue. We begin with an audio visual to start with, please. Let's take a look. The Nobel Prize Series India 2019. Once again, a big shout out and a big welcome to the student dialogue we start here on. This is a student dialogue. We need to tell the audience today, students are here. Come on, students. Let me hear it out. I know you can do even better than this. We are students. One more time, a big applaud. Now that's awesome. That's what we call awesome. To give away the opening remarks for the students and on behalf of Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and Dr. Renu Surup, Secretary, we request Dr. Muhammad Aslam, advisor, to please address all of us. Let's have a big round of applause for him. Thank you. Very good afternoon, all of you. On behalf of Government of India, Department of Biotechnology, I welcome you all in this afternoon session of Students Dialogue of Nobel Prize Series 2019 at NABI. I am extremely delighted to be here amongst such distinguished company. This year's theme of the Nobel Prize series is especially relevant to us in India, the youngest country of the world, as we embark to achieve our Honorable Prime Minister's vision of 5 trillion U.S. knowledge-based economy. The young minds we inspire today will lead not only India but the world through the challenges of 21st century. We are privileged to have the company of two distinguished Nobel laureates here today. And I am immensely thankful to them for accepting our invitation. I hope their journeys and stories will not only inspire all of you here, the dear students, but also encourage you to work towards your dreams. And as I it was mentioned already in this morning, today, maybe there is a future Nobel year at here amongst us, amongst students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now request the CEO Nobel Media, Laura Speshman, to please come forward and address all of us. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Dear students, warm welcome to you all. Welcome to Nobel laureates, distinguished guests, friends. I'm very pleased to introduce this dialogue, which is part of Nobel Prize Series India 2019. It includes not only this dialogue, but also the teacher summit we had this morning, which filled this auditorium with many teachers, and also the inauguration of the exhibition about the Nobel Prize for the greatest benefit to humankind. I warmly encourage you all to visit it, to uh, get marveled by what different Nobel laureates have done throughout history and about the challenges we have for the future and how these things connect. So it, it's right there, don't miss it. Joining us this afternoon, we have distinguished Nobel laureates. As you know, or as you probably know, the Nobel Prize was named after Alfred Nobel. He was a dynamic and successful Swedish entrepreneur who, in his will, written in 1895, wrote about a prize which should be awarded to those who have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. He was not only an entrepreneur and not only a chemist, but he was also an avid reader. He read lots of books of both fiction and philosophical works. Among the writings he left behind, because he did not only read, he also wrote, there was a black notebook where he wrote about different philosophical questions. Many of these notes are reflections about what he thought about knowledge and uh, how knowledge was created and how we could get knowledge ourselves. So as you can hear, he had a very curious mind. So we can definitely say that Nobel was not only a chemist, an inventor, an engineer, a businessman, an author, a pacifist, he was something else. He was a learner. So I'm very pleased to be joined by so many young learners today. Again, and before I conclude, on behalf of the Nobel Prize Museum and Nobel Media, I would like to thank you all for being here. I would like to thank the B Department of Biotechnology and uh, Dr. Renu Swarup for our collaboration, the State of Punjab for hosting us, Nabi for sharing these venues with us, our Nobel International Partners, 3M, ABB, Ericsson, Scania, and Volvo Cars, and the Meta Family Foundation for giving us their great support. A big thanks to the Embassy of Sweden for our collaboration, and not least to my dear, dear colleagues for making this all come true. So finally, again, enjoy the afternoon, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, and with that, I would please invite uh, Karen Clenson with Dr. Kailash Satyarthi to please conduct the session. I'm just giving all right, all yours. Okay, it works. Such a great joy being here in Mohali and such a privilege for me, I'm Karen, uh, to be your guide now for two hours or so. We have amazing guests, as you already can see, and they will share their thoughts on education and learning. Uh, and why not start with some important lines? The universal Declaration of Human Rights is a milestone document in the history of humanity. And listen to this, because this is really good. Everyone has the right to education. Education shall be free, 
at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. Elementary education shall be compulsory. Technical and professional education shall be made generally available and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. Our first guest was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. He is a child rights activist who had been working for decades to end child exploitation and violence. Kailash Satyarthi puts the words, everyone has the right to education, into action. Give him a warm hand. So I'm back. How many of you attended this morning? Almost everyone. But trust me, I'm not going to repeat the things I said this morning. But when young people were asked about this session, is it productive? Then there was a lot of response from the back. Is it inspirational? Everybody said, yes, yes, yes. Is it really inspirational? Abhi thoda dhima ho gaya. Adolescent hai na jada yahan par? High school wale bache. Are you going to enjoy this or not? Okay, thank you. I shared a short story which I am going to share again before the media. While thanking the Nobel Museum, the Nobel Media Group, University, etc., etc. of you have been able to take some photo or selfie with brother Serge or me? How many of you did? Several. And several have left. When I was a... Something is wrong. Is it better? Hello? Okay. So, when I was young, I learned about the Nobel Prize. And since then, I had a dream. Don't misunderstand me. My dream was very simple. That I wanted to greet and meet a Nobel laureate and wanted to shake hand with him or her. But more importantly, I wanted to take a photo, which was very difficult when I was a child to take a photo because some of you might not be knowing that the cameras were even bigger than this dais, the big cameras. So I had to wait for 50 years for that moment when I met the Holiness Dalai Lama in Germany. We were sharing dice. He was holding my hand because I was very nervous, having goosebumps in my body. But I was looking for a cameraman that if there is one cameraman can take a photo so that I can keep in hold my life. But there was no cameraman. So Dalai Lama asked, are you nervous? I said, no, sir, I'm waiting for someone. That's all. There was no photo. Forget about selfie. Then I had to wait 50 years, as I said. Again, I had to wait for a few more years. When on 10th of October, my Nobel Prize was announced. 
2014. I did not want to miss that opportunity to have a photo with a Nobel laureate, so I rushed inside my washroom and I stood in front of the mirror and I had a phone with camera, so I took at least a dozen or two dozen selfies. That was my first photo with a Nobel laureate. So that's why I was asking that how many of you have taken the selfie or photos. I did on that day when my prize was announced. But you are fortunate that you are able to do it now. So one day definitely you need not to rush when your Nobel Prize would be announced to go to take your selfie. But I am so happy to be with you. I am going to have some question answer. But let me tell you that your presence, the presence of young people from schools, colleges, high schools has brought tremendous energy in this hall. The reason being that I strongly believe that if we have to make this world a better, sustainable, peaceful, safe place, it cannot be possible without the leadership of young people in the world. Youth should be the leader and sit on the driving seat. You need not to follow others, you should take the lead. And perhaps many of you are aware that most of the very influential and impactful campaigns in the world are run by the young people and adolescent people. Do you know that the most known campaign for environment and against global warming is run by whom? Do you know? Can anybody tell? Who is leading the campaign? which is supported by the United Nations agencies, presidents, prime ministers, and the, the whole world. Okay. There is a girl from Sweden where the Nobel Prize comes from. She decided that she is going to skip classes to challenge government and challenge the world that they should be adhered to the promises that they have made in the past, in Paris Accord and other places. The girl is, young girl is Greta Thunberg. It is led by a young lady. You might also be aware of a campaign, in fact it is a movement for democracy, which has, in fact, challenged the mighty government of China. And that is led by a young man, now he is 23, uh, 23 24, but when he was 17 years old, he challenged the Chinese regime, those who wanted to curtail the democracy, and imposing their rule in their own way in Hong Kong. And his name is Wong, W-O-N-G. Wong was the person, young person who has challenged as a youth. Today is a very special day for me. Two years ago, thousands of young people in Kanyakumari gathered from all across India. And we had launched 11th of September 2017, the India's longest march against child sexual abuse and child rape. Four children are either raped or sexually abused every hour in India. Eight children go missing every hour in India and these are the reports, government reports. The, reali the reality is even bitter and bigger. Many more girls and boys are abused and raped 
but they don't complain because of social taboo. But this is the reported data. So we organized a long march, which was led by the young people. 1.2 million, 12 lakh youth and other people joined in the march to demand a strong law against rape and sexual abuse of children. And the institutional mechanism to ensure that the law is implemented. The march went across 12,000 kilometers distance, zigzag march. And when we ended up in Delhi, the marches were hosted by none other than the President of India and President House. And within a year, the laws related to this issue were amended. Within one and a half year, the government of India as well as the state governments, most of the state governments have not only changed the laws, but they have allocated adequate funding to ensure that the laws are implemented. This is the power of young people. You know that how last year, when the Peruvian government imposed a law for compulsory work for children and young people, the youth have opposed it and within no time it has become a big movement across the country and the government has to withdraw it. In South Africa, the government has raised the fees, school fees, college fees, and the youth stood up against it, and finally, the government has to take it back. These are certain examples of the victory of the young people, their resilience, their conviction, their courage, their commitment for the betterment of society. Dear friends, you are a few of them. Adolescents will change a new world. You can do it. You will do it. I have launched the Human History is the largest ever and the most ambitious campaign involving youth across the world, and that is 100 million for 100 million. 100 million young people of your age, your sisters and brothers, are victims of violence, slavery, trafficking, prostitution. And on the other hand, hundreds of millions of youth in the world are willing to take up challenges. They are willing to change the world. They are full with energy and enthusiasm. They wanted to do something and prove themselves. And many of them are sitting here in you. So we launched this campaign about two years ago, and in less than two years, it has spreaded across 35 countries. Many people from Sweden are sitting here. All major student unions of Sweden, four major student unions of Sweden, three national teachers unions, teachers associations, joined the campaign with us. They are leading the campaign in the country. And when the Swedish government last year, year before last, has almost made a decision, and that was announced in the newspapers, that they are going to reduce the funding on education under the Global Partnership for Education. There was a havoc because it could be followed by the neighboring country like uh, Oslo, uh, Norway and others. The youth organized a movement across the country calling the politicians to go back to their schools. So many of the parliament members, 20% of Swedish parliament members visited their schools where they studied in their childhood. And when the young people in universities or in high schools raised this voice that Sweden is not a poor country to reduce the funding for education in Africa and other developing world, you have to maintain that level of funding. ODA support. I tell you that in the end of the campaign, there was a special hearing in the parliament, inside the parliament house. All the youth leaders, student leaders and the teachers organizations were invited. Some ministers were sitting there, number of parliament members were there. The director general of CEDA was there, that is the development agency. I was also invited. 
and when youth raised this voice again, the same evening I got a message from the Director General of SIDA that they are not only going to maintain that level of funding for education in developing countries, they are going to enhance it almost double. So that is the power of young people. Dear friends, most of you think that your heroes on the, are living in the silver screens. The cinema heroes. It's good to learn something from them and be inspired with their art, with their acting. Many of you think that heroes and your icons are those who make two centuries, three centuries in the cricket ground. It's true, you can learn from them. But sometimes some of these top Hollywood and Bollywood actors told me that we do acting. And when we do acting, we charge huge amount of money. Our fees is very high. When we touch the feet of our mother on the cinema screen, we are given good amount of money. When we love a girl on the street, then we are given money. When we kiss someone, we are given money. When we do some good work, there is a dialogue writer, there is a director who tells us what to do and how to do. So I ask you, dear friends, if you do some good thing, is there any director who is giving you direction that you do this good thing today? Koi hai director jo aapko kehta hai ki aaj aapko muskara ke kisi ki madad karni hai. Haan ya na jor se bolo. Nahi ya haan. No ya yes. Koi paise deta hai. Kisi bude admi ki madad karte hai, kisi maa ki madad karte hai. Paise deta hai koi. धीरे बोलते हो तुम लोग फिर कैसे बदलोगे दुनिया को यस या नो नो सो इफ यू डू दो थिंग्स फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट एंड विदाउट एनी डायरेक्शन बाय डायरेक्टर और प्रोड्यूसर दैट मींस यू आर द रियल हीरो दे आर द एक्टर्स एंड यू आर द हीरो द रियल हीरो रिसाइड इन साइड यू ए चेंज मेकर ए चैंपियन इज इन यू Whenever you do any act of good for the society, that hero does, heroine does, you are the real hero. So tell me who is the real hero? Are you are itne dhire bologe to kya fayda itna bada ye novel logon ne paisa khach kiya tumko bulaya hai. Who is the real hero? Haath utha ke batao, jor se bolke batao to to ye dubara karenge nahi to bhag jayenge ye chhod ke Sweden. Who is the real hero? Tell I am the real hero. Tell I am the real hero. Who is the real hero? Pura sentence bolo. Who is the real hero? I did not say that raise your one hand, raise your both hands because you have both hands. Who is the real hero? Who is the real hero? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> that's a good atmosphere. Thank you, Mr. Kailash Satyaiti. So, uh, you and your team, do you hear me? It's hard, to, it's hard to hear each other here on stage. That's why we're leaning. Uh, yeah. uh, you and your team have liberated more than 88,000 children from slavery, trafficking, labor, and they have been put into school instead. Where does your strong belief in education for everyone come from? Uh, there are a lot of theoretical things I can tell, but let me just share the story of very first day of my schooling when I was about five years old and went to school. I saw a cobbler boy sitting outside the school gate he was looking at our feet, not, not, our, not at our faces. So I was very disappointed. 
In my classroom, the first question I asked to my teacher was that, Sir, why a child is sitting outside and not with the rest of us in the classroom? He said, calm down, this is your first day, make new friends and so on. When I went back, I saw the boy still sitting along with his father under the open sun outside the school gate. I was more disappointed. I asked this to my mother, my friends, relatives. Everybody has more or less the same answer. That made me very, very angry inside. Because everybody was saying that they are poor children, they have to help the families. I believe in God. So I thought that how God can be so uh, meager or so uh, unjust. So I, I started thinking. One day I gathered all my courage and went to the child and boy, the child and his father. Child was shy. Then the man answered with folded hand. Babuji, I Sir, I never thought about it. He said that my father, my grandfather and all of us went to work since our childhood and so is my son. And then he took a pause. And he stood up and said to him in Hindi, You know how far the government of India is, how far the government of India is, what cruel is our caste system. He said with folded hand, Babu ji, school jane ke liye to aap log hote hain, hum to gulami ke liye paida, mazduri ke liye paida huye hain. He said that you, are, you guys are born to go to school, but we are born to work. And I started crying out of anger and pain because I had no answer at the age of five and a half. But I started thinking that whatever my teachers say, whatever my parents say may not be right. Because that could be the mental complacency. The young people should have courage to question. It could be wrong but because it, it has been there for ages and people think like that. So that boy has given me a new perspective of life. I started seeing the world with a different eye. My eye had question, not one question but millions of questions. And I tried to find the answer. And I strongly believe since then that no child should be engaged at work at the cost of education because education liberates. Education is liberation. We have to fight for it. And that time, nobody was working and thinking on it. Even the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted by the General Assembly in 1989. And I'm talking about uh, 60s or so. So it was very hard. But gradually, my conviction, my belief in the power of education grew. But of course, I don't want to see that education becomes a kind of a tool of this so-called growth engine and be making our minds mechanical and just uh, uh, money mentality and materialistic and earning and so on. How education can liberate us from inside and how education can liberate the people from all kinds of injustices and exploitation that grew up in, in, in my life and finally one day I gave up my career as engineer and I, I jumped into it, I embarked on the issue which was a non-issue. And, and, and uh, many great achievements since then but there must also be challenges in your work. What would you say are the main challenges in what you do? The main challenge was really the mindset. People uh, normally have two or three different levels of relationship with the children. With their own biological children, they appease them, they make them happy, uh, they pour them with a lot of uh, you know, consumer goods and clothes and shoes and toy, toys and whatnot. And they dream for the best future uh, for their children and so on. That's one thinking. For the neighbor's child, you can be a little bit sympathetic. For an unknown child, you just ignore. And those who are able to do something to earn money out of free labor or child, uh, free or, uh, or cheap uh, labor, then they look for a child to exploit. So also in, uh, in prostitution, in forced beggary and any other kind of work, uh, the body of a child is used being the most miserable and vulnerable, they consider them like that, physically and mentally. So, this is a long uh, list, but uh, 
I, uh, I think that uh, this has to be changed. We have to create a world which is child-friendly world. So child-friendly world means keep the best interest of child in the nucleus and then rest of the thing should revolve around it. I always call for a child-friendly politics, child-friendly economy, child-friendly religions, child-friendly society, child-friendly culture, child-friendly schools, child-friendly cities, child-friendly towns. So we have to prioritize uh, the issues of children and that can, uh, that can work. And I have to pay the cost fighting against those people. My left leg is broken, my right shoulder uh, is broken, my ribs and my backbone have serious injuries. You can find the scars on all my head and bodies. Whenever we try to challenge those mafia groups who are making money out of selling and buying the children in lesser cost than the animals, in India, in Pakistan, in many places in the world, in Latin America, in Africa, I met those children whom we rescued. They tell that they were sold for 10,000 to 15,000 rupees, but a buffalo or a cow in their village is sold for uh, 200,000 rupees or so. So, th this, so these people who are making money out of this, they considered me as enemy, so they attacked me. I lost two of my colleagues. They are martyrs. One was shot dead, one was beaten to death. My house, my family was attacked many times. My office was burnt. This, this, was, the, this was the path. This was the journey. But each time when these people tried to kill me or attack me, I became more and more confident in myself and my work. I, I could feel that these people who wanted to eliminate me, they are threatened by me. They are threatened with me because they think that if Kailash Satarthi will be alive, then this exploitation will have to go. And I tell that if Kailash Satarthi is alive, and we, I am I'm alive, I am not going to leave anyone. I will see the end of child slavery in my lifetime. That is my conviction, my commitment, not just dream. And you will see that you will read, young people will read in the, and your children will definitely read in the history books, that there was an evil in the world called child slavery, child trafficking, child prostitution. That is going to be ended. I, I, you, you speak a lot of compassion and empathy. Um, and you say that even though people try to frighten you, you don't fear them. But seeing what you see, knowing what you know, do you ever feel fear, uh, uh, angry, anger? Do you ever, yeah, angry, do you feel angry? Yes. Actually, I'm driven by two things. They look like opposite to each other. And sometimes when I sit like this with uh, the Holiness Dalai Lama, he's like my father and friend, so we talk and we fight. So I am someone who is an advocate of anger and compassion simultaneously. I know that anger is there in each of us. We suppress it. We are preached by our religions and cultures and teachers and parents. Don't be angry, don't be angry. But we keep on suppressing that anger. And that suppressed anger can sometimes we become even more volatile and violent and destructive. So, I say that anger is an energy. As an electrical engineer, I know that how we convert energy of tides and, you know, uh, streams and floods into electrical energy. And the same energy, nuclear energy, uh, must be, um, you know, uh, converted into the these coolers on, and these uh, air conditioners. So, uh, go to the nuclear chamber and see at this cooler, this is the change. So, I want to tell one thing for young people to be angry. But this anger should not be driven by hatred, by egos, by wasted and selfish interest loss or sometimes by revenge. Then it becomes destructive and destroy you and others. So the anger should be protected properly and it should be converted into good ideas and then action. So good ideas against injustice, 
and wrongs around us, evils around us. So anger could be used as a fuel to change the, any kind of wrongs and evils and injustices around us. So we have to keep this anger alive and convert into ideas and action. So anger, idea, action. You can do it. That sounds like a very good plan. Um, what have your experiences on, on, on a very general basis taught you about human nature? Human nature is the combination of uh, several factors as we know. And uh, it is also influenced by the entire ecosystem. But the very basic nature of human being has two core instincts, I would say. There are so many, but in my opinion, two. One is the consciousness, another one is compassion. So the journey of consciousness is the journey of awakening, journey of understanding the things, journey of questioning the things, and journey to find solutions to those things. This is a journey of consciousness. So everybody has to have consciousness more alive, more active, more charged. Because when we were born, our being as human being was a consciousness. We could see, the, we can touch, we can feel, we can cry uh, and so on. But there's another thing which is compassion as I said. So we are all born with compassion. Our touch with our mother as the duly born child and demand for milk or demand for safety or protection was compassion. The mother's touch for a child was compassion because no mother, when the child is born, I'm not talking about one out of one million, you know, uh, other bad examples, uh, but the motherly touch for a child is the feeling of pain of that child, feeling the demand of that child, feeling the dream or aspiration of that child as your own aspiration, as your own pain, and then you solve it immediately as mother. So those who have compassion, everybody has compassion, but we normally lose the path of compassion because we live in a world where we are pushed by knowledge, you know, information, consciousness, and we keep on moving towards that direction and we made a lot of, you know, great things in the world. But if we lose this connect of compassion, which is the mother of all the religions, Tell me any religion, any religious, uh, you know, in reformer or religious uh, re founder of any faith or religion has not driven by compassion. All of them was sparked by one thing and that was compassion and they linked it with consciousness but their drive was compassion. All the revolutions and changes in the world, all transformation in the world, transformations for betterment of humanity in the world was sparked and driven by compassion. All revolutions. Talk of Mao, talk of Lenin, talk of Che Guevara, talk of Fidel Castro. All of them were ignited. Their, their, their action was ignited by compassion. Of course, they have gone in a different path. Path could be different. But the ignition is same. So we have to keep this human uh, nature of uh, compassion and uh, consciousness together. And the mix of it will give birth to all good things, including conscience. Then you become more conscious, then you will understand the, the difference between good and bad. So if you are compassionate, if you are conscious, then you are able to generate more and more conscience inside you and outside you. Uh, listening to your inspiring words, I have to ask you, do you need to be an optimist if you're an activist? Of course, without dream, you cannot be an activist. You, cannot, you can be reactionary, you can react to certain things for time being because you are affected by those things, so you think that, no, no, this should not happen. But as an activist, as a change maker, one should have dream. And not only dream, in one sentence I am going to, or three sentences, 
I am going to give you a mantra, which I normally give to the young people. Not the mantra to go to temple or mosque or, or church. You can practice it now onwards. That is 3D. The first D, dream. What is the first D? Jorse Bolo, dream. The second D, discover. So dream, big, bigger, biggest. If you are allowed to dream, why you wanted to dream to become just a teacher? Good to be a teacher, good teacher, but you should dream to become the, the, the chancellor of the university or president of university. If you are doing a politics, why you dream for a little politics? Why, why don't you dream to become the prime minister of this country or the president of this country? So dream big. But those who dream for themselves only, they never leave the footprints in making the world a better place and safer place. So dream for nation, dream for the whole world, dream for humanity. So first dream. Discover, discover the power inside you. As I said, everyone is born with divine power. And the God, if you believe in God, God can never be so meager to give you some drops of energy and power and potential. The God will give you the ocean. God has given you the ocean of compassion. But you confine your compassion just for your own siblings or your close ones. You expand that circle of compassion so that everybody could be embraced and come inside it. So, you are ocean of those great things. This is discovery. And discover outside, outside opportunities. Since this exhibition is lying here, tell your friends, tell your relatives, go to the people and tell them that there is an opportunity. Don't miss that opportunity to go and be inspired and learn from this exhibition, which is, which is great. So discover. And if you are able to dream and discover, the third thing, what can be the third thing? Do. Don't sit quiet. Don't be ideal. Idle. Dream, discover, and do. Can you, can you repeat it again? What are those three Ds? Loudly, loudly, loudly. I can, I can hear the voice of girls is getting stronger. So you are breaking the shackles of 5,000 years old. No domination of male in India. So that is great that you are. So tell again, ladkiya. Jod se bolo, kaun se teen di hai? Sirf ladkiya, sari ladkiya, first aana hai. Ek, do, teen. Aur ladke? You can see the boys. So the world is changed. Thank you so much. A warm hand to Kailar Satyarthi. So since... Um, uh, thank you again. Amazing. Uh, since 1901, 930 Nobel laureates have been awarded. And in a couple of weeks, in October, we will get the new laureates from 2019 in physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature and peace, and the added category of economics. This week will be the very peak of a very uh, secretive and complex work from the Nobel committees. And we are so happy to have Julien Sirat here with us, who is working on the Nobel Committee for Physiology or Medicine. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you some insight about the Nobel Prizes. And I've been a member of the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute since 2006. And so what I'm going to do is share some insight on how the Nobel Committee in Physiology or Medicine is working. So the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 
is decided by 50 professors at the Karolinska Institute that cover a diverse range of, of medicine and physiology. And this group is meeting five times a year and selects the Nobel Committee. The Nobel Committee is 15 members who are working very hard every year to identify the greatest discoveries in physiology or medicine. Alfred Nobel was incredibly specific in his will in that he said the scientific prizes, those for physiology, chemistry, or physics, should be awarded for discoveries. And interesting, we just heard a mantra, and they were three Ds, and one of those Ds was discovery. So Nobel probably would have liked that quite a bit. At the same time, the laureate's work should have conferred the greatest benefit on humankind. These prizes cannot be awarded for leadership in a field of science. They can be awarded for a discovery, and that might just appear in one scientific publication, so a discovery. So every year, we start by reviewing the nominations that come in. The nominations for individuals come from the entire world. And what we're looking for is one to three individuals who can be identified for discovering an aspect that changes the way we look at physiology or medicine. So we really look at a discovery, and that discovery should be either a new paradigm or paradigm shifting. And we spend a lot of time with something we call the deletion test. If those individuals hadn't ever performed that work, would we actually have that knowledge in our hands? So it's really important to identify the candidates. And we do this by commissioning reports from around the world to ask experts on the nominations and the individuals nominated and what their work means. So we sit in a room where 50 members sit around the round table and we can really have big, vigorous debates about the nominations that come in every year. And this is the room where we're working and in fact the doors are quite special because they're double doors. So everything we do is very secretive. So once we take the decision on who the laureate or laureate should be for a particular year, the first order of business is to contact the laureates and generally by telephone. And this is a picture of Euron Hansen and it's in 2015 where he's ringing James Rothman and in fact this time he awoke him from a deep sleep to give him the happy news that he has received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 2013. So many times the laureates are quite surprised because it's a very secretive business. The other way laureates can react is with great excitement. And this is Mybrit Moser. And this is her reaction after hearing that she has received the Nobel Prize in 2014. And I think that we're going to hear from Mybrit today. But oftentimes the laureates are very um, unaware that they've even been nominated. So here are some tips for all of you, young students who are entering out in the world. Here are some tips on how to become a Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine. So the first thing you'd need to do is make an important discovery because the prize is awarded for a discovery. You should also be prepared to fight dogmas. Be willing to go where no other person has gone in your research. There's no requirement that you publish the work in a high impact journal. And it's important to get incredibly good, strong training. So education is vital. The background of an individual or where you live in the world is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is the discovery you've made and the impact on humankind. And of course, one should be patient because it can take many years before the discovery is made until the award is um, granted. So one of the advices I had was be prepared to fight dogmas. And here's an example 
of two Nobel laureates, it's Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, and they received the Nobel Prize in 2005 for their discovery of the bacterium Helicobacter pylori and the role in gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. And they really fought dogma because until their work, people generally believed that stomach ulcers were because of stress and spicy food. But they could identify that this was because of, 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 of a bacterium. So they fought dogmas and they were awarded for that. Another example is that your background is really irrelevant. And so this is a picture of Jeff Hall, and he received the Nobel Prize in 2017. And if you just take a look at him, he might not be what you expect of a scientist. But he is a very creative individual. He fought dogmas, and he undercovered some remarkable biology about how our circadian rhythms affect our behavior. And then finally, I'll give you an example of where you should be patient. And this is Tu Yu Yu. And she received the Nobel Prize in 2015 for her discoveries concerning malaria treatments. And as a little anecdote, before she gave her Nobel lecture, I met Tu Yu Yu and I said, we're really looking forward to hearing your lecture. And her response was, well, I don't have anything new to say. The work is so old. And in fact, her discoveries were made decades before the prize was awarded. And my response was, but that's exactly what we want to hear, your seminal work that led to the prize. So be patient, because it may take many decades before your discovery is acknowledged by an award. So with that, I hope this gives you a little bit of inspiration. And that I said it earlier this morning, but who knows, perhaps one amongst you may be the next Nobel laureate. And if you're interested in more information about the Nobel Prizes in chemistry, physics, literature, economics, or peace, which I didn't have time to talk about, make sure you check out the website, NobelPrize.org. So enjoy your conference, and I hope you come away from this being very inspired. Thank you. We all know that changes can be very hard, even within a family, uh, not to mention a school or a university. Or if you would like to reform an entire education system within a nation. We are so happy to welcome our next guest who works with exactly this, changing huge systems and improving the educational system in India. Please give Lina Vadia a warm hand. So thank you so much for being with us here at the Nobel Prize series. Um, you have a background as a researcher in physics, uh, but since 2017 you have been on a committee um, to prepare the draft of a national education policy for India. What is this policy about? So I think this is a very hopeful moment in our country because we are getting a new policy after more than 30 years and we have tried to make sure that this policy will change education in the country completely. We hope it will transform it um, and but that depends a lot not just on the government but on every teacher and student here in the room and around the country. So it's a policy that covers students from very young ages, from, I like to say cradle to grave. So it takes also into account um, continuing education, um, lifelong learning, adult education, but also early childhood care and education. So people have called it a transformational policy. It's not yet accepted by the government, but we have good reason to believe that the government is going to accept it the way it's been prepared and conceived of. So, thank you. 
if, if, we, if we talk about higher education and universities, they can be very old and they can um, uh, have traditions that of course are it's positive, but it can also maybe be a burden. Uh, if you look at society today, is there a need to update universities? I think that that's an interesting question, but I think that the idea of a university as a place where students can come, meet each other, learn from each other and from their faculty, that idea will never really go away. Because in a university, you don't just acquire knowledge, you grow up as an individual. You learn to do what Mr. Satyarthi said, which is, you know, dream and discover and do things. Many of the things you have to do have to be teamwork. So you have to learn to do all that. So you need a safe space to do that. So I think the idea of a university will not go away. That's my, th my uh, personal feeling. But on the other hand, if universities don't respond to the needs of the time, then particular universities can certainly become outdated. I, uh, that's what I think. I guess when you, when you want to make changes in the education system, it would be easier if the future were predictable, um, so that the changes you do today will be relevant tomorrow. Um, what do we really know about the needs uh, in education in the future? So I'm old enough to remember the advent of personal computers, the internet, the World Wide Web, you know. And when they came, I think the people who were watching the education sector knew that it, they would make a profound impact on education. So I'm, I don't, I'm not pessimistic that we don't, we don't know what the future of education is. I think we know what the future of education is if we are willing to uh, you know, observe the society and the world around us and think a little bit you know, about what is, what is the need of the hour, actually. So you know, the, it's for sure it's going to be driven by science and technology a lot. We discussed that. Uh, uh, many people discuss that during the day. But there are many, many social challenges also to be overcome. And India as a country needs to lift many millions out of poverty. So there are economic challenges also to be overcome. And all of that has to be an integral part of education. So um, I think, um, and we see some of the difficulties in our society today. We don't talk about it much. It was referred to a little while ago about caste and the divisions, how we like to create divisions among us and, you know, deny people opportunities. Those things have to change and education has to come, step up and deal with them. So that's the future of education. In terms of actual, you know, the way you go to university and take classes, I think it's clear that the boundary between uh, your workplace and university will become more porous. You will go out, work for a while, come back, learn some more. In Japan, they are experimenting with not having students in classes at all. They just run around in parks. So that can also happen. So there are, you know, of course, the, and a lot of online courses are coming, so that will change the delivery. But I think the, the role of educational institutions and the role of education will remain central in our lives. We have many students here today, and, and in what way uh, do you think that the suggested policy will affect them? So students will be, I mean, affected both directly and indirectly. So, I mean, at the end of the day, if you are transforming education, it is to benefit a child or a student. Yeah? And so almost everything that is said in the policy Will, is meant for uh, the betterment of students, you know, tra better training to teachers, better infrastructure, you know, freedom to educational institutions to offer new and interesting courses. But also the students will have much more choice in what they want to study and how they want to, to study. So that will be, uh, uh, you know, it, 
if you're willing to take the initiative, there are many opportunities uh, that are opening up for students. So if, if, if there is a student here who, who's a little bit uncertain what to do in, in life, um, what, from your perspective, would be the, the main reasons uh, to continue study uh, in general or science uh, in, <laughs> in specific? I trained as a scientist, so I would say that science gives you the framework and the tools to understand the world around us. I mean, from everything, from the cosmos to the planet to, you know, our human society to our bodies and how we think and, you know, all, all of that. It helps you um, develop a scientific temper. It helps you learn to, to question the truth. And if it's not the truth, we discussed this this morning also, to be able to say, okay, if this is not true, what is true, actually? So these are wonderful things that science gives you a framework to do. So I would say that education and in general and science in particular are very, very important. For Thank you so much. Give Lina Varia a big hand. Thank you. Usually people will say knowledge is power, and it's true, and when people talk about education, unfortunately today is basically focusing on just the classroom, but I think beyond the classroom, how we're able to open the minds of ourselves and young people to be critical thinkers. You have indoctrination, you know, in which people are not encouraged to use their minds. Real education is critical in mind formation. The ability to look at more than one aspect of an issue. So, really and truly, that education that will make a person to, to have more compassion, to have more humanity, is the kind of education that the world needs here. Yeah. That's what I understand by education. And that requires, of course, uh, really educated minds to, to bring about that formulation of the mind, especially in young people. In 2012, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to Serge Aroche for his, and listen carefully now, for his groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum system. Or perhaps an alternative motivation could be, in 2012, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to Serge Aroche for his groundbreaking curiosity. Please. Can you hear me? Okay. So thank you. I will talk today about uh, creativity and especially how you can really stimulate creativity in young people. I would like to start by saying that, uh, in fact, children are curious about the world around them and so are scientists. In fact, scientists, basic scientists, are driven mostly by curiosity. They want to understand the world and they want to have answers to really big questions. And uh, I think this is the wrong one. This is the talk I gave this morning. So I need, I need to have the other, other slides. I don't want to repeat the talk I gave you this morning.
Yeah, thank you. So we're waiting for the technique to um, be with us and not against us. Yes, this morning I gave a talk about the way to educate young children in science. And this afternoon I think I will talk to you about how to stimulate creativity in older students, students in high school or in universities. And I have prepared some slides for that and so I hope I will be able to show them soon. So I, I would like first to recall that, in fact, bright students are attracted to science because they want to answer basic questions. And the kind of questions they are addressing are just uh, shown here. What, are, what is the origin of the universe? What is the origin of life? How does the human brain develop through uh, when, when life has evolved according to the Darwinian evolution. How does the brain work? Where are we heading to? Is there life on other planet, on exoplanet, which are now being discovered? And if you think about all these questions, these are curiosity-driven questions. They don't give you any more power over nature. These questions are not answered because you want to build new instruments or to have uh, more power over nature. They are just driven by mere curiosity. We want to understand the world better. And these are big questions in physics, in chemistry, and in biology. And when you ask these kind of questions, uh, what comes to mind in a very strange way is uh, there will be a panel. this so you need chairs. picture. Uh, you so see here, be, it's when, a picture when I which was the panel, you can just made. Go up with the it's, it's yes. a so picture which was made by Gauguin, which was a master, a for, French for master, so who lived at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And That's it okay. looks very strange. They have very mysterious uh, characters, uh, what, what old and young yeah. people, which seems to be reflecting. And for some strange reason, Gauguin called this painting, Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And this summarizes, in fact, the big questions that scientists are asking to themselves. And I think that young people are asking to themselves and explain why they are driven towards science. I also want to recall the memory of a physics Nobel Prize winner, Leon Lederman, who, after he got the Nobel Prize, devoted uh, the end of his life to try to promote science among young people. And he developed the project ARISE, which is an acronym for American Renaissance in Science Education. It started about 20 years ago, and it has tried to renovate completely uh, the education of science in the United States. The goal of this program was to make students comfortable for science, with science for the rest of their lives. So it was a very ambitious project. And Lederman said that he wants to make young students understand concepts, the process of scientific thought, and what is very important, science as a human endeavor. I think what he meant by this is that if you learn the way science works, the way to ask the right questions, you 
not only learn about science, you learn about the way you should behave in life in general, because this scientific process is something that is very useful in other activities than pure science activities. So Lederman developed this project, and in fact it was a three-year project which started in ninth grade for students who were about 15 years old, and he wanted to teach science in what he calls the natural order. The natural order is physics first, because physics teaches the principle, the way nature is working. Then chemistry, from the principle of physics you understand how atoms form molecules. And then when the molecules become very complex, it leads to biology, to the study of the evolution and life. So he wanted uh, to apply a very reductionist project, a very natural and rational project. And I must say that uh, this project uh, found a mixed success because the main reason why it was not completely successful is that it's very hard to start with physics without the student having all the mathematical knowledge which is required for that. Physics requires a lot of math and in ninth grade a lot of math such as calculus is not yet available to students. So you have to address this in a more flexible way and teach chemistry and biology at the same time as you teach physics. But it was a good attempt to make a rational uh, education in science. I will talk now about my personal experience. Why was I driven to physics uh, when I was young? I was first driven to science because I had really a passion for mathematics. I was very curious about numbers when I was in elementary school. I liked to compute things, I liked to play the kind of games that I showed this morning about how to uh, bypass, when you have to add numbers, how to bypass the simple operation and find general ways to count. And then when I went to middle school, I, was, I had a passion for geometry, and in high school for calculus. Calculus describes the way mathematics enables us to compute how things change, change in space or change in time, using what is called, known as differential equations. So this was pure mathematics. But then I was fascinated by the fact that if you master mathematics, you can also understand how nature works, because nature obeys to mathematical laws. Uh, when I was in high school, it was a time when the first uh, rockets and satellites were sent out in space. And I was amazed by the fact that with a small amount of calculus, which I knew, I was able to compute the velocity of a satellite around the Earth and the escape velocity which uh, satellite uh, a rocket should acquire to escape from the gravitational field of the Earth. This was very simple calculus and it gave orders of magnitude of things which were happening in the news, which I can read every day in, in the newspapers, and this was really fascinating. I must say also that I was very much interested in history, and the history of science has always attracted me. And I, I like uh, the statement by Newton, which said, if I had seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I have this very strong feeling in me that when you do science, you belong to a community, but not only a community of people who are living today, you belong to the community of all the generation of scientists who before you have built up the science that you are able uh, to do today. So it's a very exhilarating, it's very exciting to think that you belong to a human activity, a human endeavor which goes beyond boundaries, which goes beyond time, and which touch all, the civil, all civilization and all generations of people. So now I would like to answer the questions that I have been asked to answer here. How can you foster creativity and imagination in students in high school as well as university. And I want to start by a caveat. It's very difficult to define creativity. Creativity is something that you recognize when you see it, but I am really, I don't have a very uh, easy task if I want to give a definition of what it is. I think the best way to foster creativity is to combine in the education technical training 
which includes mathematics, computer science, abil ability you give to students to compute and to calculate, but you have to combine this also with humanities, with the history of science. The te technical science should not be seen uh, completely cut off from humanities, because humanities is, leads you to think, leads you to develop your imagination, and it leads you to have new ideas to think out of the schedules, to, to think out of the blueprints that the preceding generations have prepared. It's also important to show to the students the inter interdisciplinarity nature of science. Science is not divided into closed categories. If you want to do science in an open way, you have to take into account that science belongs to different fields at the same time. For instance, there is a link between astrophysics, which is studying the universe as a whole, and particle physics, which is studying the universe at the microscopic scale. And in fact, cosmology tells us that what happens in the early stage of the universe is relevant to particle physics. At the early stage of the universe, the universe was so dense and so hot that the physical processes which occurred there are similar to what we can reproduce now with big accelerators. So there is a strong connection between large-scale and small-scale physics. Another domain which is also very interesting is that there are connections between physics, chemistry, and biology. Physical chemistry and chemical biology are two very important fields. And in fact, <coughs> this is demonstrated by the fact that very often biology and physiology Nobel Prizes are given to chemists and very often also uh, a physicist can get a, a prize in chemistry because the fields have very uh, strong links with each other. And a third domain in which you have such a connection is of course climate change studies. To understand climate change you have to do a lot of physics, the thermodynamics of the global warming, you have to do chemistry to understand why the CO2 molecules or methane molecules are uh, absorbing infrared radiation and of course you have to understand a lot about earth studies, about uh, geophysical studies and so on. You have also uh, to recall to students that great scientists of the past practice interdisciplinary science. If you look at really the giants of physics, Galileo, Newton, Huygens, were at the same time working in optics. Of course, Newton is very well known for the discovery of uh, the nature of uh, the light, the fact that the white light is made of the spectrum of colors. And at the same time, he made a huge discovery with the discovery of the laws of gravitation. In the same way, Galileo invented the, the, was the first one to use a telescope to observe the skies, and he also developed the pendulum and made very important discoveries in the domain of mechanics. Uh, closer to us, Thomas Young this helped to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphs, and he also discovered the wave nature of light. And Einstein made really breakthrough discoveries in thermodynamics, in relativity, and in quantum physics, which are fields which before him were completely disconnected from each other. So, it's a good example of the fact that you have to learn in different fields and not to focus yourself in a narrow field if you want to be creative in science. Now, the last uh, question I would like to address is how do you foster persistence in students? What persistence means that you should not get lose courage if you don't succeed immediately. Doing science is not easy. Scientists must be passionate about what they are doing because they must have a goal which should lead them even if they are under adverse circumstances. They should not be deterred by failures and drawbacks. In the career of a scientist, there are always times where things do not work the way you expect and you should be able to take this and to build from this kind of failure. So you try, you have you have to try to learn for your, from your mistakes, and I think this is a question that we'll address later on in this discussion. 
you have also to understand that luck is part of the game. When you do, uh, when you do basic science, of course, you are looking for something which is unknown. By definition, you will have surprises. By definition, things will happen that you did not expect. And some things will be bad, that will be just mistakes, but some things will be good. You will just learn something new that nobody had known before you. This is what I call luck. But the quality of a good scientist is to be able to recognize luck when it comes your way. And there's a lot of examples of big discoveries which have been made by luck. And once the discovery has been made, it has been recognized that people have seen that before, but they had not recognized it before. So what makes a big difference between a bright scientist and an average scientist is that a bright scientist is able to recognize the luck when it, it has it. I also want to say something which very often has a tendency to, to make uh, young scientists lose lose their faith in science. They can be overwhelmed by all the knowledge which has been accumulated be before them. And one of my mentors when I was young used to tell me, you don't have to know everything about everything. What you are asked is only to know one thing, to discover one thing before the others. And this is the definition, of course, of the Nobel Prize, as was said before. The Nobel Prize is not given to someone who knows everything. The Nobel Prize is given to someone who has been able to discover one thing before the others, and that's the only thing which is asked from you. Now, the last advice is uh, to try to collaborate as much as possible. Of course, since you don't know everything, the best way, if you need to have some advice, is to talk to people who are working in slightly different fields as yours. And it's always good to collaborate, because when you work in a group, it is easier to overcome the difficulties because you get advice from others, but also because if you work in a team, you help each other to overcome the problem and difficulties. So I would like to conclude by saying uh, something which has already been said before. Maybe in this room, you will have one day someone who will get a Nobel Prize. But I don't think the Nobel Prize is the most important thing. If you discover something new, the pleasure that you derive from what you have discovered is certainly stronger than the price itself. Of course, the price is a very big recognition for your ego, and I must say that it's fantastic to get the phone call uh, that you got the Nobel Prize. But the day I saw in the lab with my colleagues and collaborators a really new thing happening, then the pleasure I derived from that was stronger and deeper than what the price has given me. And I want to say that the Nobel Prize is something which is, has been given, as we have heard, to 930 people in one century. That is only, on average, nine people or 10 people per year. But there are thousands of scientists working in the world, and there are much more than 10 scientists who deserve the prize. It's a matter of luck. It's a matter of uh, the context in which the prize is delivered. The committee is doing a very good work, but the committee is constrained by the fact that you cannot give more than three, the price to three people per year. So it's a rule which mechanically makes a lot of people not getting the prize, even if they deserve it. So never work for a Nobel Prize. Work to really to have the pleasure of making discoveries. That's what matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Serge Aroche. Thank you. And please have a seat. Um, Aroche will be uh, joined by uh, Karni Katakur, student, and Harleen Bava, also student. And uh, this next discussion will kindly be moderated by Julien Sirat. And here come the other two panelists. So come on up, ladies. Oh, 
All right, so that was, Serge, an excellent lecture and can really give us a basis for some of the dialogue that we're going to have. So here we have Karnika and Harleen. Why don't you sit next to Serge? And I'm going to start out by asking everybody here to take a mic. And I thought because the title of this dialogue is about curiosity, I thought maybe you could each share your thoughts about what does it mean to be curious? I think it's openness to the ideas, new ideas. I think, I hope I'm audible. Uh, it's openness to the ideas and the ability to ask questions why it is happening, how it is happening. Only then we'll come to, up with the new solutions to things. If you look up a child, he's so curious at the age, like why it is happening, how is this happening. So over the time of the years, this curiosity dies. Why it dies? Because we are so judgmental. I believe that it is us who make a curious child, I mean, because of the judgment, not so curious, and it leads to, I mean, the regular routine and everything. So this All right. So Harleen, I thought we could get your views on what for you does it mean to be curious? Curiosity to me is the most important ingredient in learning process. So, because it's very simple. If a child is curious, he is uh, willing to gain knowledge. And uh, if he's willing to gain knowledge, uh, his curiosity, his uh, um, motivation is always going to be there to learn. The learning is definitely going to be there. Serge, I thought you could get your views on, for you, what does it mean to be curious? <coughs> to be curious is to try to understand something which is unknown and of course to do that you need a method and curiosity has to be canalized. Of course you can ask a lot of questions but if the question is not formulated in a way which can be given a scientific answer then it's not scientific curiosity. What makes great scientists, it's scientists who know how to ask the question and who ask relevant questions which are fertile to get an answer to. And that's very, the most important part about curiosity. Okay. Um, Harleen, I thought I could ask you, are we more curious when we're children, and do we lose some of that curiosity when we grow up? I agree we are more curious as children, because there are many questions in our mind. But uh, it all depends on the environment we are in. If our answers are if our questions are answered, the curiosity stays. Because after one question, another question arises, I mean. So it all depends on the environment we get. Serge, you're very curious. You're a passionate scientist. You haven't lost the childhood curiosity. How do you keep that? I don't know if I keep it, really, but uh, yes. Uh, I, I think what you said, it's very important to nurture the curiosity of children. Uh, the children are curious at the start, but if you don't give them answers, if you don't satisfy the curiosity and teach them how to use the curiosity, then you dilapidate it. And this reminds me a, a funny story of a father who is uh, walking with his son in the street, and the son keeps asking questions. He says, uh, father, why do uh, the moon change shape in the sky? And the father says, I don't know. Then a uh, little bit later, the son asks uh, to his father, why are the tides going, coming in and out? And the father says, I don't know. So after a while, the child stopped asking questions. And the father turned to the son and said, what are you doing? Why don't you ask questions? How do you think you will learn if you don't ask questions? So you have not only to so keep have asking the why have the, have the child getting answers. It's very important, and then probably ask again. Um, Karnika, so how do you think we can create an environment that incur encourages curiosity? First of all, we should give freedom to the child. We should not impose our thought on that person, and. Uh, Above all, we should not be judgmental. You see, a child stops quest asking questions um, when he hesitates. Now, from where the hesitation comes, it comes from, I mean, the fear, what will the society think and all. So I believe once we tackle that judgmental problem, 
I think uh, the curiosity that is in the child will stay till the old person. So we are not like thinking what the society will think about us. So it will, it might lead to more curiosity. Well, I think a big aspect is in enthusiasm and curiosity, not only in children, but even in adults. And I ask you, Serge, how can schools and universities specifically be a platform to foster curiosity and creativity? I think the question you ask is how do you uh, recognize the creativity in a young uh, boy or girl and what do you do, what the university or the system can do to make this person achieve the, these promises. And this means that once you have recognized that someone is really bright and can achieve things, you have to give him the means to achieve it. There are some countries in which you give a position to someone, but you don't give him the money required to start his own research. And immediately, the young scientist has to apply for short-term contracts. And these short-term contracts are good if you have a well-defined project in applied science. But if you are, have the ambition to start something in basic science, you need to be given at the start the money, the startup money to do th these things. And I always advocate with the French government that they should develop that more, that it's a waste, even for the government, for the state, it's a waste of resources to appoint people and to not give them the means to develop their curiosity and to apply their curiosity to their passion. Because you cannot force someone to work on a defined field. If someone is going to make some basic discoveries, it is because he is driven by an inner passion. And it has to become from the bottom and not from the top. And so you have to find, and there are some very uh, successful institutions in the world who do precisely that, to hire people and give them the time and the money and the trust to develop their uh, creativity. So we haven't talked in this session so much about the arts and humanities, but the importance of the arts and humanities in helping to foster creativity. We talked a lot about science, but could you comment, Arlene, about the idea of integrating arts and humanities even into the scientific realms to foster creativity? It is very important to foster creativity in a child because, uh, you know, that keeps the inner force coming out of a child, which doesn't let you again um, sit back. Because if you're creative, you are a um, fully developed personality. I mean, you're speaking your mind out of your creativity. So that personality can do wonders. I mean, there's no stopping to that kind of a person. So I understand you're a PhD student, yes. is that right? And so do you think it's possible to really be both creative and curious and then move forward in your scientific career at the same time? Oh, all the time. I mean, you, I mean, we happen, we, I mean, we happen to uh, come up with some situations where we need to come up with solutions that we, I mean, problems that we haven't occurred, we haven't uh, seen before. But to overcome that, we obviously need some of the creativity and obviously a scientific background to do that. So I, I think it's an integration of both creativity and the uh, scientific attitude that leads to sol uh, sol problem solving. Do you want to add to that? The question was integrating the creativity and the curiosity at the same time you're driving your science. You are driving what? Science. Yes. Yes, you, you have Curiosity is not enough. To be, to be creative, you, it's what, what we said before, you have to, to have a dream, but to do something from this dream. And uh, the, the transition from the dream to, the, to doing is the most difficult part, of course, and it is there that you have to overcome the difficulties, the drawbacks, the problems that you, that you can find in the way. And that's what makes the life of a scientist, to be able to, to meet all these challenges. And as I said before, what helps you to do that is to work in a team. I think the Nobel Prize is not giving enough recognition to the team. When I got the prize, I immediately realized that I would never have achieved that without the team with whom I was working. I recognize the rule of the game, the fact that 
there is a senior guy in the team who gets the prize. But at the same, and, and my team recognize that also very well. But uh, I'm not sure that the general audience recognize that. The, the prize is a recognition for the work of a team of people, not only one person. All right, well, I think that's a great place for us to end this dialogue. And I'd like to thank both of you, um, Harleen, and for your presentations. And let's continue the discussions about curiosity and creativity. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we will try the technique even more. Yes. <laughs> Hello. My bit more, sir. <laughs> Hello, do you hear me? So, my bit more, sir, was awarded. Oh, let's see if. Do you hear me, my bit? I will just give a short introduction. My bit more, sir, uh, is a Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine and she was awarded in 2014 uh, for specific kind of cells in the brain that serves as kind of a built-in GPS for us humans. Um, my bit more, sir, when, when we talk about the universe, we understand that it is unexplored and vast and yet so much to learn. What about the brain? Is there still something to learn about the brain? Yeah, I see. And what kind of insights are you hoping for when it comes to the research on the human brain? for your research, but you've also been rewarded for your leadership skills. Uh, what would you say makes a scientific and educational environment creative? So, I think it's extremely important that people can stay. So that they are allowed to think uh, interesting thoughts and some sort of emotional of uh, the way they're thinking and what they're thinking of and uh, it should be a very open environment and a very diverse environment so that uh, people know that they're allowed to be different and stay accepted and valued. Um, and I think it's very important that uh, the leaders are good modes and have good values and show respect for both people and also in my case, in my lab, also for the animals. And, and, and strive for getting the most happy people and happy animals that you can get, of course not. So I think it's 
so it's happy, but so that people feel safe and and, uh, and and also that the leaders are good examples, good models when it comes to asking questions mm -hmm. and not picking the low hanging fruit, but fresh. Uh -huh. <laughs> A last question, my bit more. So we are soon uh, to have our final panel, and we will talk a little bit about mistakes and failures. How do you deal with failures? Uh, that's such an important question because uh, what I typically say in our lab is that uh, I live in a country where we go skiing. Um, and uh, one of the rules that we learn when we start to go skiing in the mountains, especially, is that you should be ashamed if you have to turn around. And you have to know when you turn around. And that is also how it is in science. If we knew all answers, science would be boring, it wouldn't be interesting. We don't know all answers, and in some cases, how to ask the question in a different way uh, to get uh, an unanswered uh, question. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for those inspirational and comforting, and comforting words. <laughs> Thank you, my bit more, sir. A warm hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I would like to welcome all the panelists on stage for a final brief discussion, please. Yes, yes. And I might, during you, you take a seat. Um, the, the Nobel history is representing in so many ways brilliant ideas and, and fantastic achievements, but also it is the history of mistakes and failures, abandoned theories, um, experiments that have gone wrong, books that have been rejected. And there is a beauty to this, because these mistakes have been handled wisely. So I would like to welcome, and we'll see if, the, if, if you hear me. <laughs> so I would just um, like to ask you something about mistakes. I mean, it sounds very lovely and uncomplicated that we learn from mistakes, but isn't, isn't it very annoying when you fail? Serge. It, it, it depends how you fail. Of course, uh, it's clear that you will fail because you may go in the wrong direction, you may have overlooked some important points, but uh, you have to learn from your, your mistake. It means that you have to know all the conditions which led you to the wrong result, to the, to the, the fact that you did not get what you expected. But as I said before, a mistake can also prepare a discovery because you, you might go in the wrong direction and then you find a surprise which change completely your previous way of looking at things, and sometimes discoveries come from, from that. Uh, so failing is normal, but of course you should not fail all the time. That's a big, big point. <laughs> yeah. Julien, how do you deal with failures? So I think you know, part, of, part of discovery is going where no human's ever gone before. I think you're out there on the edge and you maybe not always know what to expect. So one way to deal with that is to have a plan or have a hypothesis, but then before you even do the experiment, think of alternative outcomes. So you might be able to anticipate if you have what you might call a mistake, then you can have a plan B. And I think having a plan B helps you think through plan A a little bit more carefully. Well, uh, in the course of social transformation or challenging wrongs and odds, evils, one will definitely bound to make some mistakes because there is no ready-made path given to you that you can 
walk on this without any mistakes, so it's bound to happen. But I would say that uh, the mistakes are the best teachers. We can learn best from them. It help in keeping us more humble. If we are successful, then the ego goes to our mind and suddenly we think that we are successful, nothing to learn from. So mistakes give us motivation, learning, challenge, resilience and all kind of good qualities. So I think we should embrace mistakes as we do things in a proper way. Lena. Uh, so I'm not... Uh, sorry, e -paro -paro. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hello. Yeah. So I'm not doing science anymore. So um, I will say it from a different perspective. Um, from my personal perspective, um, you know, in science we had a very public failure recently, which is the uh, supposed failure, the failure of Vikram to land on the moon. And the prime minister led the way by saying that tomorrow is another day and we will get there. And ISRO is no stranger to failure. So like both Serge and Julene said that in science, when you fail, it makes you think again, what, what did you forget or what did you not think of or what are you not aware of? So there's a systematic way in which you think and learn. Um, I want, so that's in the, on the scientific side. I want to talk about my 10 years in policy. So, you know, I got interested in education, I mean, 20 years ago, I started worrying about why things are so wrong with our education. It took me another 10 years to move to out of uh, technology into, into uh, education. And these 10 years, if I ask myself, what is, the ch what is it that I have been able to do? And the answer is very frustrating, actually, because you find out what a problem is, then you go to the government, you know, you go to the state government and you tell them and then they'll say that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we agree and, you know, get us a document and we'll help you. By the time you write up that document, the, either the government has changed or the bureaucrat has changed. So, so then you're back to square one. And I've been doing that for, for 10 years now. And, you know, the last two years ago when we got a chance to do this policy, I was, you know, sort of determined to be positive and, and I am always a very positive person. But there's still the risk that, you know, 30 years later we have this new policy, a lot of visionary thinking, but it will not get implemented. So, you know, failure is just constant all the time. You yeah. just have to keep moving on forward. Yeah. Um. I agree, uh, and um, it's, it's obviously necessary for us to be willing to take risks, and it's also necessary for us to question and to, to uh, question old system and old truths. But I wonder, Julene, uh, so on, the other, on one side we should question, but on the other hand, it is also necessary that we trust institutions, for example, like science. So how, how are we to balance between critical thinking and trust? Well, I think that's a good question because oftentimes we are guided by things like a moral compass, for example. We heard my Brit talk a lot about having happy animals. And that would be an example of somebody that we would trust that she would follow the best possible standards for conducting her research. And so many of us in the science field would think about wanting to uh, adhere to different guidelines and ethics and codes of conduct. And sometimes that evolves because there may be mishaps and we realize, oh, we should really try to deal with this in a way so that we all have a consensus on, on a behavior. And so that's one way to manage this. I think it's on. Yes. <coughs> I think this question arises more in biology and medicine than in physics. Uh, but in physics too, you have some this kind of issue which can come. Uh, for example, physicists can uh, 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 nuclear energy is good when it is used for nuclear power plants, but it has to be controlled when it's used for arms and armament. And uh, so we have this kind of ethical issues. 
and there are also these ethical issues in, in, in chemistry. Uh, what, what can develop some molecules which can be uh, useful, some GMO modified organisms which are useful. And there is a misconception in the general public and we have to make people understand that uh, scientific truth has to overcome some misunderstandings, some ideological biases uh, which make people believe that some things are wrong just because they go against their uncontrolled beliefs. And this is true in the case of the uh, uh, genetically modified organism. It is even more true for vaccination. We have some completely irrational fears which are being developed and entertained in the population and we have to go against that. And so the biggest failure of science would be not to be able to overcome these kind of problems. I, I want to, uh, talking about mistakes and failures, I think there is a difference between the two. You can have some failures which are very positive and productive. I will give you an example. At the end of the 19th century, the uh, American physicist Michelson try to measure the velocity of the, of, of the speed of light depending upon whether the, the Earth is going against the motion of the light or within the motion of the light. He made a very careful experiment and he failed. He would not see any difference. And this failure led to the te theory of relativity and to the fact that the time does not evolve at the same pace for different uh, observers. And this was Einstein's work of spatial and then general relativity. So you see a failure. What was considered as a failure at the time of Michelson became a very fruitful, a very a pro positive result later on. So it's not, it was not a mistake. Michelson did not make any mistake, but he failed, and it was a good way of fa failing. Yeah. Um, one final question. Uh, we are running out of time. and. Um, but it's an important one. Uh, Lina, what makes you passionate about your work? The, the potential to impact so many lives, you know, I, I think that's what, and I said in the morning about teachers and how they expect from you to, to give back to society, so I'm hoping that I can do that. And to complete the discussion I was saying before, I, you know, I'm not going to give up if this, um, you know, policy doesn't get implemented the way we wanted to. And in fact, we have actually built into the policy the a mechanism to to guard against exactly what happens if, uh, you know, governments change and uh, bureaucrats change and there is no continuity of decision. So the National Education Commission is supposed to keep the policy live through new governments and so on. So we learn from, from mistakes and try to uh, sort of go after the goal, which is, you know, to make a difference in education. So Thank, thank you. you. Julian, what makes you passionate about what you do? You know, it, it different changes at different phases of my career. And I think right now I get so incredibly excited when the young people around me have a success because it is just wonderful to see that look in their eye when they've solved the problem. Thank you. Serge. I think I, I am still curious because I would like to have the answer to some big questions in physics which have no answer to now. For example, we cosmologists tell us that the, the, something like 95% uh, of the matter in the universe is of an unknown nature. All the matters that we see around us, all the stuff we are made of, is only 5% of the universe. So that's really a challenging question. And my dream would be to live long enough to have an answer to that question. So it's a double-edged dream. First of all, I would like to know. And second, I believe it will take some time. So it will <laughs> leave me some time to, to <laughs> wish for an answer. But this is a big question in physics. And I think it's a question as big and as deep as the question which were asked at the end of the 19th century, which led to quantum physics and to relativity. So we are in very exciting times. 
And I think the people who believe that physics is finished now are making the same mistake as the people who believed that one century ago. Thank you. And Kailar Satyarti, what makes you passionate about what you do? <laughs> you need one of those. <laughs> same, same question? Yes, same question. Well, uh, I learned one thing 40 years ago when I started that while fighting for big success or big accomplishment in life, one can enjoy and celebrate small successes also. I wanted to see the world without child labor, as I said. My mission is very clear and big that every child should be free to be a child. Every child should be free to laugh and cry. Every child should be free to see the open sky. Every child should be in school with biggest dreams. But it is not going to happen uh, in one day or one year and ten years. So I started celebrating the freedom of one child or two children and uh, that kept, kept me passionate. But I am I'm basically driven by some basic spiritual values or spiritualism, not religious as, as such. I don't go to any temple or mosque or church or any, any place, but I have learned to feel that divinity inside each human being. So it's easy for me to have trust with others, to connect with others, to get love and respect from everyone anywhere in the world. Born in a very modest family in India, in a small place, Vidisha, in Madhya Pradesh, it was, I won't say impossible, but very difficult to dream to work across more than 140 countries. And I've been working across 140 countries for last three, four decades, much before the Nobel Prize. And to challenge the situation in those countries, which was not yet recognized as a problem in those countries. So I had trust in myself and my dream. I have full determination. And I always believe that history is never created by those people who write the history on the piece of paper. Or those who write history on, they can write history of course, on blackboard or on a wall. But history is created only by those who have courage to write the script on the sky. <laughs> so with that determination, one can work. Any ordinary person can work and uh, people will believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists for your inspiring and engaging thoughts and experiences. Uh, it has been a, a true joy. Um, the, the Nobel Prize is about learning, questioning. It's about words and it's about action. Uh, education will perhaps not solve every problem on this planet, but for sure we can't solve many things without it. Uh, the Nobel Peace Laureate Kofi Annan, he said, Education is a human right with immense power to transform. On its foundation rest the cornerstones of freedom, democracy, and sustainable human development. Thank you all for coming here today. Thank you.